Hello friends, so in the series of uh, uh, different aspects of EIA, today we will discuss the EIA process in India, how does it take place, what are the basis for this EIA process and what are different acts and what is the principle which is behind this EIA. So, all those things we will look into in today's lecture. Uh, so, before you know EIA process was defined in terms of EIA notification 2006 and EIA notification draft which is uh, currently uh, you know in the process which is draft 2020. So, before this uh, there were there were many major environmental policies. So, those policies we will discuss and uh, after that uh, we will see like comparisons between EIA notification of uh, 2006 and 2020, uh, with, uh, 2020 is still in the draft mode. Uh, and uh, you know it will be notified uh, I think soon and then possible impacts of EIA process after implementation of EIA draft notification what, what are those implied or uh, possible impacts that, that will also be discussed during this lecture and after that we will conclude. So, uh, this environmental protection act 1986 that is the basic you know uh, bone you can say of this whole structure of EIA and this act is the legal base for EIA process in India whether of uh, 2006 or whether 2020 draft notification. So, this is the basic fundamental foundation you can say of 1986 environmental protection act. So, this, this basically states in nutshell the central government uh, shall have the power to take all such measures as it deems necessary um, or uh, uh, this, expedi uh, this expedient for the purpose of uh, protecting and improving the quality of the environment and uh, preventing and uh, controlling any abetting all those processes which are uh, required for reducing the environmental pollution and to conserve the environmental resources. So, this is that is the basic idea behind this act which is in detail I have just given you in nutshell very brief uh, concept not. In, in the same line like uh, in 1988 national forest policy was launched and the basic objective of this uh, policy was to ensure uh, the environmental stability and ecological balance. So, that there is no activity which can disturb the balance of the environment as you know we have already discussed it several times that ecological balances come into picture through you know thousands and millions of years and if we disturb them due to our man made activities and then their balance can be disturbed and that can uh, you know the consequence consequences of that uh, imbalance can be very harmful to the ecolo ecosystem as well as to us also. And uh, you know this policy also tried to ensure like targets to bring one third area under the uh, plantation. So, that uh, because uh, people say that the forest lands plants are the lungs of our whole uh, you know this planet. So, we should protect those lungs and the protection of environment has been provided means it is not just out of the blue basically in constitution also in the constitution of India also in article 48A and 51A G they give this uh, you know uh, for uh, judicial interpretation of article 21 which is the protection of life and protection personal liberty. So, they are interrelated to each other. So, environmental protection is part of that like right to life you can say. So, that is uh, you, you uh, means you can interpret that it has constitutional bearing or constitutional roots uh, which, which is reflected in terms of different policies for the environment. Another policy uh, was their national conservation strategy and policy of 1992 and that uh, was uh, basically the those uh, you know in bullet form uh, basic ideas are given for that policy that is like sustainable and equitable use of resources. That means, it should not be that the uh, natural resources are accessed by some group uh, you know more than other groups of the society or the nation. So, it should be equitable means every citizen must have equal opportunity towards the natural resources or towards the environmental wealth of the country. It is not like that one has uh, some uh, privileges or others do not have this is not there. So, 
the sustainable means uh, only those kind of resources uh, exploitation or harnessing uh, should be done so that it should not uh, get uh, some harmful impacts which can completely destroy a particular aspect or component of the environment. So, it should be in a sustainable way. Then to conserve the natural and man made heritage, there are heritage of both nature like natural for example, Ganga river or uh, you know certain oceans, certain parts of the Himalayas all those are heritage natural heritage which are part of the cultural heritage also. So, man made heritage and natural heritage which are part of our centuries civilization, centuries old uh, you know thousands of years old civilization. So, the conservation protection of those heritage is also the part of this policy and preventing and controlling the future deterioration of any part of the land or water or air. So, that is one uh, very important aspect that any activity uh, which can uh, influence in negative way the land mass or the water bodies or the air shed that should be discouraged or that should be addressed properly if there is some activity in negative sense. Okay. Then development projects, so the development projects should be means of course, when we will do urbanization, industrialization or any other activity which are related for meeting our metallistic needs, okay, so, so called developmental activities when we do, then of course, their byproducts also influence the natural and uh, man made environment. But we have to take care that their adverse environmental consequences should be minimum, we have to minimize them. So, that kind of policy and policy measures as well as technological interventions we should put in place, so that the development project should not be very negative to any kind of resource whether it is natural or man made. Then restoration of ecological degraded areas, because of you know natural process as well as man made process some ecosystem get deteriorated over the years. So, the restoration should be part of our responsibility, part of our policy, part of our government programs or policies. So, this is part of that 92 national conservation strategy and policy. At the same time, you know policy statement on abatement of pollution 1992 also includes like more emphasis on pollution prevention rather than pollution controlling or cleaning after the end of the pipe. Uh, emissions or treatment like maybe it is better to you know there is a saying prevention is always better than cure. So, after emissions you know we clean the environment or after effluent we treat the effluent it is better that those kind of effluent should not be there. Okay. So, that means the resources or the raw material or in the changes of the process or technology can be in such a way that the waste discharge or effluent discharge or emissions can be very minimum. So, prevention is the basic thing or philosophy. Adoption of best available practicable and uh, those technologies uh, which can prevent pollution as I said means for example, in furnaces some people are using uh, you know that oil or coal etcetera. So, lot of emissions are there may be one can use electric furnaces. So, that kind of technology can prevent the pollution in that work environment. right? Then promotion of clean and low waste technologies, any kind of technology which result in very minimum kind of waste that is welcome. right? So, waste minimization should be there, also the waste reuse and recycling, we have to think creatively. right? So, uh, there is a saying that there is nothing waste, every waste is a resource for something else. So, if we do that kind of circular economy or circular uh, you know this in uh, eco industry uh, development, uh, then uh, we can address these issues. Also the improvement of water quality or environmental audit related processes, natural resource accounting all these come into this promotion of clean technology and uh, environment friendly technology. Sometimes people call them green technology and they are also part of new concept of circular economy in which you know every kind of waste is a resource for something. So, this is a circular economy. Okay. Like uh, in uh, I think in Denmark or so some industrial development have been in such a way that one industry's waste has been resource for the other industry. For example, uh, one can have brick uh, formation industry nearer to the uh, thermal power plant based on the coal because fly ash can be used there. 
Okay. So, that way means that way if you identify certain industries where the waste product of one industry can be used as the raw material for other industry, then uh, the, that can be a wonderful uh, process of reuse and uh, recycling of the materials. Okay, then in 2012 national water policy was implemented, water is very important. You can see now we have this you know Jal Shakti Mantrale. So, lot of emphasis is there and the reason is because over the years we have seen that uh, you know this uh, you can call that mindless development have really harmed our water resources in a very big way. Uh, I, I personally remember that uh, when I was a kid uh, in wells in Rajasthan, in East Rajasthan, wells were so much uh, you know up into water table during this uh, monsoon season that people uh, those uh, our uh, kids used to swim and uh, you know jump into them and it was very up upper layer at the, uh, at the brim level you can say. But now no well, every well is dried now those wells are nowhere open wells. Now, what is happening? We have these tube wells and the water table is you know even uh, more than 500 feet some, somewhere. So, you can see how we have uh, exploited this ground water and uh, this, this, this can be a big problem. So, to address those things uh, now national water policy is there and objective is that we have to take cognizance of the existing situation which is very serious means many times you might have heard that the third world war will be on the water. Okay? The access to the clean water or the usable water is a big challenge uh, everywhere because we need uh, usable water. Water is there, but uh, usable water may not be uh, inaccessible uh, reach. Okay? To propose the framework so that a system can be created and laws and institutions can be put in place so that the conservation of water may be there and it can be uh, in a holistic way. Right, plan of action in a unification manner, so that at the national level one policy can be uh, thought upon and implemented properly up to the last end like at the village level or so. Then uh, you know 2006 national environmental policy uh, was uh, put in uh, place like better livelihoods through resource conservation instead of their degradation. So, again positive outlook and greater role and responsibilities to the local bodies. That is very important you know. When people participate in any program then success rate is high. Otherwise what happens you know us and they that kind of division in the thought does not help. Means if you force some policy from outside because of some governmental institutions if local pol people are not taken into trust or in, into like uh, participation then they will not be able to uh, visualize that this is our policy. They will see it is outside some group is there, they are doing because of their own some interest and there are many issues. Okay? So, the local bodies uh, you know role should be defined, their responsibility should be defined then success rate becomes high. Then EIA act as principal methodology for appraisal and review of the new project. So, this philosophy was taken into account that the EIA must be there, a good document should be prepared based on uh, complete study, so that objective analysis can be there and uh, one can see if there is any kind of positive or negative impact on these all three uh, you know part of like society, economy and the environment. Then coordination among stakeholders okay, between uh, government, uh, between industries and between like uh, users or uh, uh, rural folks or wherever industries are being put or any project is uh, brought upon. So, those local population must be uh, brought into picture. Environmental protection as an integral part of the development means development should not be uh, delinked with the environment. Any development activity which is harmful to the environment should not be accepted. That means, the proposal of the development or development activity should be totally integrated, they should be unified, they should not be separable. Means, whenever we talk about the development, we should talk about the environment and we should uh, you know put policy in such a way that any development activity should not harm the environment, rather it should protect or it should add value to the environment in one or the other way that is very important. So, the EIA notification 2006 was brought okay, <coughs> that this will be the way of uh, environmental impact assessment henceforth and you know this is again uh, legally based on environment protection act 1986 that is the you know foundation thing 
on 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 that foundation you know some structures are put in right and it has certain restrictions it is putting some restrictions on prohibitions on new projects or modernization of existing product projects or activities in terms of like environmental implications that that's the uh, thing and it is applicable to every part of india including uh, you know territory territorial waters and all those uh, components of national boundaries then restrictions based on potential environmental impacts that is the uh, important thing because we have to keep environment every time when we talk of any development or industrial activity then state environmental impact assessment authority that was made and what kind of authority it is how it is defined it is constituted by central government and there are processes like three members including chairman and member secretary should be in that committee and state or ut union territory that will forward the names of the members and member secretary to the center to get approval and those members shall be professionals or experts it's not like some political uh, uh, member can be there because professional or experts who understand the whole uh, uh, you know this scenario or whole uh, action interaction of the environment and development activities they would be able to add value to the whole process so this is defined that professionals or experts will be the members and one of the members shall be the chairman okay in that and decision of uh, committee shall be unanimous means it's not like one has dissent or something like no one they will be consensus they will reach to a conclusion and it will be taken in uh, you know meeting uh, or uh, otherwise like major majority or uh, whenever majority prevails then it is a committee's decision means even if somebody having some reservation ultimately it is the committee's decision there is no like if and but something like that constituted after every 3 years so that new uh, you know people can come with new perspective new ideas new outlook they can contribute in constructive way right and then the need of environmental clearance without environmental clearance project will not be implemented so that is very important thing so that has been part of the legal requirement right environment clearance is the legal requirement without that project will not be implemented okay so the proponent of the project which uh, permits to start the project they will get the environmental clearance and this environmental clearance is needed before any construction work or preparation of land by the uh, project management except for securing uh, like uh, purchasing land etc but when you are preparing for that project then ec must be there this is this was the uh, you know first priority or first requirement then projects requirement requirement for environmental clearance which kind of project should be there so all new projects or activities listed in eia notification of 2006 so there is a list which projects will require eia okay and different categories are also we will discuss those later on and the expansion of activities listed in that notification 2006 with addition of capacity building or capacity beyond the limits specified that would also need eia it's not that once you have made the project and then you can do anything with that project no you have to define if it is you know beyond certain limits then again new ai is required any change of uh, in a product mix in an existing uh, this manufacturing unit beyond the specified range so there are some limits or range which have which have been specified beyond that uh, you you need again one more eia if uh, earlier eia was done no problem but if you are changing that thing beyond a limit then again eia is required <coughs> okay now uh, you know the process of environmental clearance how this environmental clearance is taken so ec for project activity we have to think about and categorization through screening process means when we see what kind of project proposal is there so accordingly the notification says that in which category it will come okay so a category projects or b category projects according to 2006 we are talking environmental eia notification of 2006 we are talking not of the 2020 draft notification okay please make this uh, remember this then it is done by uh, ministry of environment and forest and climate change and this eac that uh, committee and uh, this uh, seiaa which we just uh, uh, you know we just dis discussed state environment impact assessment authority that will take the decision according to uh, it is written here also uh, all these acronyms 
Okay, so what are the project categories? How we define A or B those kind of things? So, there are some guidelines like high impact projects or you know medium impact projects. So, accordingly A and B are there. So, A are high impact projects which have you know highly impactful and B medium impact projects. So, two broad categories A or B have been defined. So, that if something fall in B category then how to process further and something is in A category then how to do. Okay? All these things have been decided and divided properly. So, if you see in this table categorization of transport sector uh, because this is the uh, you know course of transportation systems. So, uh, otherwise EIA talks about every kind of industry or development activity, but we are just uh, you know taking example of transport sector because this is more nearer to our this course. So, airports project type. Okay? So, all airports will be in category A, this will be not be in category B. Oil and gas pipeline, the, these will be again in category A, right? aerial rope wage, they will be in category B, harbor port according to their you know handling capacity like more than 5 million tons per annum that cargo, cargo is handled by that port, then uh, this uh, excluding fishing harbors. Okay? only those cargo related uh, ports uh, or harbors which are dealing with more than 5 million tons per annum cargo they will be in category A otherwise less than that will be in category B. So, that is important to uh, distinguish between this highways new national highways okay? expansion of national highways greater than 30 kilometer or involving additional right of way greater than 20 meter involving land acquisition and passing through more than one state means interstate, then those highways will be in category A. Otherwise, new state highways which do not go beyond one state or you know they are uh, in within this reach of uh, 30 kilometer national state highways greater than 30 kilometer involving additional right way of greater than 20 meter involving land acquisition, but they do not go beyond one state then they are part of category B. Railway projects do not come under EIA notification of 2006, okay? but EIA report is necessary for other clearances such as forest clearance or other uh, you know related clearances. Otherwise, you know like uh, these are not treated uh, 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 for other like other uh, highways or airports etcetera. So, this is uh, given some kind of you know because of its uh, role in uh, our goods and services to the passengers that, that may be one reason. Change in project category means once uh, one category is there, but in some situations one category can go to other category. For example, category B will be treated to category A in some cases. For example, if it is located whole or part within 10 kilometer from the boundary of these four kind of uh, zones like uh, under wildlife protection act if some area is defined and that project is within 10 kilometer of this uh, zone then this will be treated as category a even if it was category b according to that table which we just discussed okay then notified eco sensitive areas again if project within that area or within 10 kilometer then this will be category A. Critically polluted areas as notified by central pollution control board, there are certain industrial areas which are highly polluted. Okay? So, we do not need more projects there, otherwise they will add into uh, more pollution. Okay? So, if within 10 kilometer of that area critically polluted area that will be treated as A. So, more stringent uh, rules regulations will be applied. Interstate boundaries and international boundaries. So, nearer to the 10 kilometer again even if project is small that will be treated as category A project. Okay. Then application for environmental clearance. So, that is the part of whole EIA which is submitted to the agencies which are responsible for giving uh, you know environmental clearance. So, the applications for seeking uh, this environmental clearance is uh, submitted in terms of prescribed form 1 and form uh, 1A which will we see later in, uh, in next slide. And then applicant will furnish some pre feasibility project report certain guidelines are there for that to submit that report. And pre feasibility project report would not be required in case of few projects 
then a copy of the conceptual plan shall be certain categories are there where pre feasibility project report is not required then conceptual plan will be required. So, it is not like uh, you do not need to submit anything and you can get uh, environmental clearance it is not so you have to submit some sort of information to the decision making uh, organization or agencies. So, we were talking about form 1 and 1 a uh, what is this, this application. So, this is a kind of checklist uh, okay, that gives different parameters. So, tick tick yes no those kind of thing checklist is there in terms of the impact of uh, details uh, like yes or no. The 93 parameters in 10 categories of the impact which we discussed earlier. So, those are in that checklist. Okay. Form 1A requires to fill details about 10 impacts such as vegetation or air quality or water quality or uh, you know solid waste related things those issues are listed there and they become part of form 1A. Pre feasibility report is consist of like what is the background of the project a brief description of the project then site analysis where it is located, what are the weather, climate conditions, then what are the proposed infrastructures when we are going to develop it, rehabilitation or resettlement plan if that kind of issue is there. Okay. For example, in dams related activities uh, those are the part of uh, the whole uh, plan or EIA. Project schedule and cost estimates that should also be there because cost estimates and the project schedule will give. Uh, us an idea that how many years it will go on and uh, when cost estimates is there then there are certain activities. So, with that activity we can relate what kind of impacts may be there. Overall analysis of the proposal in terms of like social, economic and environmental impacts that will be the detailed part of the pre feasibility report. Then if there is no requirement of pre feasibility report then you have to give a brief conceptual plan. So, again project description is there, site location, important features of the projects, impacts if any. So, these are the things which are required for even smaller projects. Then we see the steps for scoping uh, process in EIA notification according to 2006. So, the TOR terms of reference comprehensive terms of reference for the preparation of EIA report by the applicant has to submit according to the those guidelines right. Then site visit by a subgroup of appraisal committee is compulsory so that they can see the site in physically and they can relate those impacts which can be uh, possible in that site in that location. Then TOR shall be conveyed by the appraisal committee within 60 days of the receipt by of the application means this is the responsibility of the appraisal committee if they want to give some comments on the TOR they accept it as it is or they want to make some changes they have to give within 2 months period to the uh, client. Well, <coughs> so if TOR are not finalized and conveyed to the applicant within 60 days provided TOR will be assumed final. So, if no comments are received that means the whatever TOR you have submitted that is fine that is acceptable by the decision making body. Okay, that approved TOR shall be displayed uh, you know on the website so that everybody can uh, see it. So, the whole transparency is there because there are so many stakeholders wherever project is coming there are so many stakeholders even if they are not part of that project because the project will directly or indirectly will influence their life. So, even if some villager is there he has or she has you know equal right constitutional right that they should know what is going on because of this project. So, TOR is visible to all. Okay. So, on the website of MOEF Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change it will be available. Then the prior this EC or environmental clearance may be rejected on the recommendation of the appraisal committee that is possible okay, uh, on the basis of whatever information has been given they can decide okay, this is not good something has to be done. So, the reason of rejection shall be communicated within 60 days. So, again timeline is there. So, responsibility is there for the committee that you cannot just linger on, you cannot harass the client, they are the part of our country building activity. So, if you are not satisfied give them answer. So, that accountability is there that is wonderful part of this notification. Then public consultation is also important means project is coming somewhere. So, the public participation must be there, public hearing must be there. So, those kind of issues are implemented in real sense public meetings are uh, organized and the any public uh, member can give some feedback or they can ask some queries. So, that is part of this whole EIA 
and you know sometimes if uh, this public uh, consultation is not possible then uh, you know one has to define the reasons and uh, alternates like maybe some uh, representatives of the public can be invited and feedback can be taken something can be done but it cannot be ignored totally right now some examples that why it is so important okay so in year 2011 UP government uh, you know had done this acquisition of land for Yamuna Express uh, uh, way around Greater Noida, but there were some issues. So, agitations uh, you know erupted and uh, this political and social crisis kind of situation uh, emerged right. So, if public participation had been done properly and documented properly and uh, you know there was no gap then such situations can be avoided. It, that means, the public participation and public consultation must be in a transparent way, there should not be scope for any doubt and uh, maybe some legal uh, documents should be signed by both parties, so that there is no scope of uh, making uh, misinterpretations of any situation. Okay? Similarly, like exception cases where public consultations uh, of uh, this uh, uh, project is not required then there are certain conditions or uh, situation like expansion, expansion of the roads and highways which do not involve any further acquisition of land. So, for that no public consultation is required that is uh, you know just uh, waived off. Similarly, projects or activities concerning national defense and security. So, again that are uh, kind of uh, public consultation is not required because the most important thing is security and defense of the nation that is the first priority of whole country and society. So, we can get away with this so that those projects are not hindered. Okay? So, involving those kind of strategy considerations and uh, so that is exempted. Then specified projects within existing industrial estates and uh, some irrigation projects which are of utmost uh, importance for farmers, for those uh, you know deprived groups of the society which needs uh, uh, you know a fast development kind of things. So, that kind that, that kind of thing can also be exempted in, in certain cases. Then appraisal process for EIA notification 2006, so the clearance is taken or rejection is there all those things have been has should be communicated properly and which we have already discussed that within 60 days these kind of things should be communicated. Like post uh, e, uh, this EC means uh, like environment clearance has been obtained then monitoring must be there. Okay? So, half yearly every 6 month when project is going on, so a report should go to the uh, this MOEFCC and pollution control board, what kind of activities are there, what kind of impacts are there, all those things. right? So, every 1st June or 1st December each of each calendar year, the report should go for the monitoring compliance are there or not, whatever guidelines are there. So, those compliance should be a kind of public do document and it should be accessible to all. Then, uh, you know like uh, some environmental clearances are there and let us assume that uh, Suppose, uh, uh, you know one uh, contractor cannot uh, 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 complete that project because one or other reason right? and that project has already got the environmental clearance. So, that clearance can be transferred to another agency if that agency is hired to complete that project. So, that kind of possibility is there, but with same terms and conditions there should not be any major change which can add into some negative impact that is not uh, acceptable, but transferable of the EC is possible in certain situations. Okay? Then now we are talking about EIA notification 2020 draft. So, on the basis of some feedback from different stakeholders groups like even NGOs or uh, environmentalists or experts etcetera or maybe industrialists or industrial groups. So, new EIA notification is building and the 2020 draft is uh, was there in public mode and uh, anybody could give some feedback. So, uh, that new draft has been there in the for the public comments and feedback uh, in March 2020 okay? and this notification will uh, come in force on the date of publication of that final notification after incorporating whatever changes or suggestions which have been received from different walks of the people then it will be a official gadget. So, then it will be into force legal force. Okay? So, legally based on again 
Environmental Protection Act 1986 that is the basic bone of all these acts. Now, if we want to see what is the difference between 2006 and 2020 uh, this EIA notification. So, there are some uh, differences like uh, you know in uh, uh, this EIA notification 2006 there were only two major categories of the projects A and B. In this uh, you know 2020 this B category have been split into two B1 and B2 again based on certain feedback. So, three project categories are there. Various terms were not defined in 2006, they were you know implied kind of thing, but in 2020 notification every term is properly defined, there is no ambiguity because of that right. Yearly data is required for impacts, data of one season is sufficient in, in new guidelines. So, it can be quick, but which kind of uh, you know season has to be chosen, so it is better that uh, you know those kind of seasons should be chosen uh, which gives us kind of worst case scenario. So, that we can have better idea about what can happen in negative way and we can address them properly. Monitoring at every 6 month as we have seen 1st June and 1st December, now yearly monitoring can be there. So, because of you know some uh, technological interventions maybe those kind of paperwork is not required there are other ways to monitor and to do compliance. Then monitoring report by third party this monitoring has to be submitted by project proponent himself or herself means that agency they can submit again as I said there are so many technologies that uh, you can always catch hold if uh, there is some manipulation or not. So, uh, because of those uh, new technologies it is possible to uh, get away with those uh, more rigorous uh, monitoring compliances. Then uh, increment in project categories in EIE draft 2020 like from B to B1, B2 and those kind of categories are there because of certain uh, you know dimensions we will see in this example. Like uh, you know airports ok all airports are A like water air drums uh, these have been defined commercial use heli ports all these are now in B2. So, one definite terms are there other, otherwise earlier there was like ports only right. Similarly, like oil and gas again it is in A, elevated roads or you know flyovers or bridges uh, more than uh, 150,000 square meters built up area that will be in B2. So, you can see A, B1, B2, harbor ports uh, earlier all these ports were like more than 5 million TPA tons per annum they were in A and then B category was for less than uh, this uh, 5 million. Okay. But the B2 category is now all projects in respect of inland waterways. So, inland waterways lot of focus is there of the government earlier that was not part means in, in uh, it was not specified properly. Now, in B2 category it has been incorporated that is welcome step. Similarly, highways have been categorized into like B1 and B2 depending upon their length and uh, you know their width etcetera. So, these are listed here. Then there are you know certain terms which have been defined in uh, 2020 which were not defined properly in uh, 2006 like uh, uh, EIA uh, should be done by some accredited environmental uh, assessment groups or people those organizations which are assessment consultant organizations and they should be you know accredited in by NABET national accreditation board for education and training of quality council of India. So, again more formal more professional way of doing things otherwise earlier sometimes you know uh, some people used to do not with such a serious um, way any other agency may be notified by the ministry from time to time. So, it has been properly defined similarly like dredging how to do although earlier also I said that dredging is not encouraged. Uh, now, new technologies are coming because dredging is not so environment friendly. Then for border areas uh, you know within 100 kilometers these areas have been defined er earlier there were debates which are the border areas to what distance something like that ok. Similarly, like green rating for integrated habitat assessment GRIHA, Indian Green Building uh, Council all these you know certificate which can be issued by those agencies are defined. So, that one can flag uh, my project is so good because it has got, got certificates from these uh, environment friendly related agencies. Okay. Then 
some district divisional level expert appraisal committee has also been properly defined earlier it was not so uh, categorized properly. Exceptions for assessment of B1 category projects for EIA like uh, earlier also there were some categories, but any project or activity specified in category B1 shall be appraised at the central level if located whole or part earlier also we discussed in the B category if you remember the so similar project pro protected areas, critically polluted areas, eco sensitive zones all these or severely polluted uh, areas or eco sensitive zone within that boundary uh, 5 10 kilometers. So, it has been again defined that even if B1 category is there, it will be treated as A because the center will take the uh, cognizance of it directly. Then uh, this uh, monitoring, monitoring has been like earlier uh, twice a year as we have already seen in the difference now once a year and the compliance can be done by the proponent itself. Examples of like some weak monitoring processes. Uh, there are real life examples which gives us lessons to learn like there was polymer, there is polymer plant in Vishakapatnam and uh, you know there was some geese, le this gas leak and because of this uh, you know uh, it was uh, uh, death of 11 people and approximately 1000 people got sick and what was found that over two decades without environmental and safety clearances this uh, you know uh, setup was going on. So, these are the you know missing gaps or uh, negligence which should not be tolerated. If you know this process was there, so this kind of things might be avoided because when you do some processing, some monitoring properly, then auditing happens and things come into knowledge that oh this is the gap we have to address, right. Similarly, like uh, this uh, refinery in SM, uh, it has uh, uh, severe damage to the livelihoods because of you know this uh, fire in May 2020 and it was operating for 15 years without any environmental and safety clearance. So, these kind of negligence should not be tolerated and they should be brought into this complete EIA uh, process that this the monitoring should be continuous, there should not be any gap and uh, they should be made legally uh, you know binding. Okay. So, the new draft of EIA 2020 uh, that is uh, are there and it uh, uh, th there is some you know implications like any environmental impact during one season except for river valley projects. So, again there are some schools of thoughts or uh, some people who are arguing that it is not good. One season people may try to manipulate, they may go for any season and uh, it may not be worst case scenario and then the impact may not be so severe which can be in uh, the severe uh, kind of condition. So, those kind of issues are there, but uh, maybe notification comes then they, they are all addressed. Similarly, air pollution related like which season should be there, what baseline data can be there if uh, you know summer or winter, because if something is done in summer, maybe in winter because of inversion that situation can be totally different, right. So, th those issues are there and they, they should be addressed. And uh, we hope that when 20, uh, this uh, 20 new notification will come in 21 uh, or they or uh, um, we are not sure when it will come, but all these issues will be addressed we are hoping so. So, in nutshell we can say that uh, the EIA process has evolved over the years and now our EIA process is very good and this takes uh, you know notice of everything which can influence the environment in negative way. And, uh, these are the references which you can go through. Uh, you know, there is lot of information on uh, the website of uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. You should go through those notifications. We have just given you know some bullet form information, but notifications are quite detailed. So, please go through those notifications. It will give you better idea, better understanding about the whole EIA process. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, we will continue on uh, you know certain case studies later on. Thanks again.